This conversation is with David Tate, CEO of the World Gold Council. David has had a remarkably successful career in banking. He started his career in trading and portfolio management and ended his banking career in 2016 as the global head of macro products at Credit Suisse. Today, as the CEO of the World Gold Council, David has a clear and ambitious vision for the global gold industry, which we'll be discussing in detail. David is also an outspoken advocate for children's rights. Ever since he started earning a salary, David donated and raised money for NSPCC, the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. In order to support the organization, David has opened up about the abuse that he himself suffered as a child. He also climbed Mount Everest several times and he inspired the incredible movie Sulphur and White, which portrays his unique life story and which I recommend everyone should watch. We have edited this conversation into two parts. We're sharing the first part where David shares his personal story, a story of horrendous abuse, but also astonishing resilience. And the second part focusing on the global gold industry. I hope you enjoy this conversation. And most of all, I want to thank David for this very special and very inspiring conversation. Thank you, David. So, uh, David, welcome to uh, to Switzerland and uh, to our offices here. I'm I'm extremely happy to have you here. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you for having me. And we'll we'll cover quite a bit of ground, your personal story. Uh, then we'll also touch on gold and your vision for gold uh, in your role as the as a CEO of the WGC. And we'll also talk about the big picture a bit and um, maybe the fact that we're looking at a world that uh, has some risks in it. Let's put it that way. So maybe starting with um, with your personal story. Uh, last night we had dinner. And I hugely enjoyed your stories about Mount Everest. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. We start off on that uh, on that note. Sure. Um, I've been raising money for a charity since I left school, since I got my first job. And I've been for relatively small amounts. I think the first thing I did was abseil down a building in South London, decided to do it face first to raise a bit more money. But, and it was like a few hundred pounds. And then over the course of my career, I just raised money discreetly and sent it to the charity. And then uh, in 2004, 2003, sorry, I was sitting at a hedge fund looking at the TV and the Chinese got to the top of Mount Everest and broadcast live. And it was spectacular pictures. And I'd exhausted every other form of fundraising from base jumping to crashing race cars. Wasn't very good at either. <laughs> and um, I looked up and I saw the majesty of those pictures. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. In 2005, I climbed it for the first time, and I raised so much money unexpectedly, as uh, I was a partner at Blue Chris Capital at the time, surrounded by very wealthy and nice people who caught me completely off guard. I thought I was going to raise 20,000 quid as my target. I raised 270,000. Wow. And I suddenly realized I had a vehicle that I could raise significant funds. Well, couple that with the fact I'd come back from Everest and climbed the mountain, I was euphoric. And as a contrast to where I spend most of my life mentally, which is beneath the zero line, for the first time in my life, I was found discovered what happiness was. It doesn't sound a bit dramatic, but it was just like that. It was found like I found my own class, personal class A drugs. So you've been, you actually were there seven times, right? And you actually yeah. went to the peak five times. That's so right. You actually, five successes, you, you succeeded uh, two failures, times. yeah. Um, one of the stories you told us yesterday, I think, which which might be good to tell, if, if you like, is the one where uh, you actually um, call your wife and she decides that she would like to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I know, I know, she's she's going to be successful one day. <laughs> um, uh, just the firstly, um, yeah, a remarkable woman. Um, I put her through misery and she's whack-a-mole. It's my nickname for her, <laughs> which is a sad reflection on me. But yes. Um, in 2013, I was, I'd been given a flag by Her Majesty the Queen to get to the summit in celebration of her 60 years on the throne and the first steps of Hillary and Tenzing on the throne, the very, on the summit of Everest on the very first, same day. Mm -hmm. And she came to the charity, I was given this flag 
and charged with getting there first. So no pressure. It was like the biggest pressure I've ever felt <laughs> in my life. So I rocked up, super fit, and we trained to go through the ice wall. And one day I was going through the ice wall with a small group of um, guides who were my best friends by now, having done it so often. There were six of us in a row, and we were, we were spread out roughly 50 meters apart, which is sort of unusual, except for a lady from Swiss TV who was just behind me with a camera who was filming me. By chance, she asked to. And behind her was a Sherpa. And I had a helmet on for the first time in history, and I had uh, Jimi Hendrix in one ear, luckily. And there we were. And we were going through a place called the Popcorn Field in the ice fall. And it's just dawn. And suddenly I heard... That's still at the bottom of the mountain. Yeah, and at the, the bottom, yeah. in the Kumbu ice fall. Yeah. And I suddenly heard this dreadful roar. It's a unique sound. You never forget it. Can't be replicated. And one of the guys at the front of the queue shouted, run. And I looked up and the mountain was coming towards me. The Serac had broken off. And I looked, I looked back and I tried to take two running steps, even though snow was to my knees. Can't it was get going anywhere. nowhere. Yeah. Glanced, it was almost on me. Dived, put my head behind a block of ice, covered my face up. It cannoned into me from the side, twisted me round. My arm got caught and my shoulder popped. S twisted me round, something smashed onto the top of my helmet like biggest clang in my head I've ever, ever felt. <laughs> something cannoned into the small of my back. And then the most painful thing was something hit my leg, lower leg. And in that, under the snow, in the dark, I thought my leg's broken. The pain was unequivocally, my leg was broken. And then the sheer terror of that moment will never lo lose me. You think you've been scared, right? You've had little run-ins here and there. No, no, no. When you're scared, you'll know it. <laughs> and I really thought I was going to die. Terrible feeling. Desperation. You don't want it. Anyway, in the dark, with my face like that, I remember thinking legitimately three things. Firstly, your life really does flash in front of your eyes. It's a peculiar phenomenon. You see everything in a second. Can't explain it. Second thing was my leg's broken. Queen's going to be really pissed off. Because <laughs> I won't get the flag to the summit. I remember thinking, oh God, how do I tell her? Well, you're British, you have your priorities, oh, right? Well, yeah. The Tower of London awaited. <laughs> and the last thing was, um, I really didn't want to die. Because up until that point in my life, really, maybe a few years before, I'd been sort of ambivalent on that point. Mm. And so life was becoming more sure for me, and I didn't want to depart this mortal coil. Anyway, I reached out with my left hand, this one was over here somewhere, and I could feel the ground, and I stood up out of snow and ice, which had covered me by about a foot or two. I was very lucky. I didn't know at that point. Yeah. If I'd done that, nothing had happened. Eesh. I stood well, up, turned around, and the Swiss lady had gone. And she'd uh, been shoved into a crevasse by her Sherpa. We rescued her later. And um, she was hysterical. We got down to base camp, finally hobbled down to base camp. They put my shoulder back. They injected <laughs> it all over, drained my leg of stuff. And then the expedition leader came up to me and said, David, a few days later, David, there is a four hour Everest summit window available, vaguely, three days away, do you want to go for it? Um, normally it's five days up, two days down. So yeah, it's a big ask. Mm -hmm. So I called Vanessa again, expecting her to say, don't be ridiculous, wait two weeks or come home to me, darling. You were hoping. She said, go for it. <laughs> so I looked at him, okay. And we did. And three days later, we summited, which was camped to two, one, zero to two, two to four, four to summit, and down in one day, which was the most tired I've ever been. I was only, at, when I was at the bottom, I remember only being able to walk three or four meters before sitting, three or four sitting at the very end of it. But I was first, and I got the flag up there, and I handed it back to the Queen, who asked me to sign it when I got back to the UK. <laughs> you must have been in so much pain. I, I was, mean, yeah. Because uh, your injuries, that was well, only like three enough, days after you had that, that yeah. accident. Funny enough, the shoulder was okay because I was able to juma with my left. That didn't work for too much. My back was just ached. The helmet I'd replaced. My leg was okay because the big boots hold your ankle still. When I took the boot off, I couldn't do that. So I was walking like Frankenstein. So that was okay. Um, and I had more drugs inside me. <laughs> then, uh, you know, an LA addict. I was like, I was flying. It's good. I survived. Everything's joined on still.
Well, we're glad we have you. And <clears throat> I guess maybe something that obviously drove you was was the purpose of it all. I mean, you mentioned now a few times the, the charity and the fact that you uh, were raising money. The charity, was that from the beginning, NPSCC? Uh, yeah. So I have to, for those watching, that's the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, which brings us into the subject of the film that you made. But was that from the beginning? Was that always the charity that you supported? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> from the moment I started to earn anything, yeah, I started to send them money, um, which was, I suppose, uh, 20, 20 years old, really, mm. my first job. I send a check. No one would know, and um, I would do silly little things like I described, which ended up being quite dramatic things. And then climbing became such high volume and with such amazing potential to raise the money mm -hmm. that um, in '07 I decided to pass on why I was doing the climbing and the reason why I would keep going back, and keep asking people for. Um, sponsorship and because I was driving everybody crazy you see right. so that's when you decided uh, to do a film the film for those who've never seen it is called sulfur and white and so how did that come about just before the 07 climb my begging email for sponsorship contained fateful line at the bottom it said please sponsor me because I was one of these children and I never told anybody mm -hmm. only Vanessa knew even my adult children didn't know. It was a big moment. Hit send, run, essentially, on that email. I got back. I was pretty beaten up. I lost a vast amount of weight. And I had, obviously, I was all over the place. So I took three months off. And rather to occupy my time, really, I decided to rug out my laptop out and start writing. So there I was at home, and I wrote a story. And because the climb had been epic, I wrote seven or eight chapters of climbing, ascending the mountain. And I wrote seven or eight chapters of idiosyncratic items or stories from my life that I thought, in my mind, mapped back to a certain reason. So as you ascended the mountain, you went down my miserable story, such the summit chapter was the, the explanation was there. So I thought this book was genius. Is the book's name also Sulphur and White? No, it was no. called, uh, at the time, it was called uh, Forgiveness. Okay. That was the manuscript. Okay. Anyway, I thought this was brilliant. Mm. And I handed it all to book agents who thought the opposite. They thought it was way boring. They could get, can you, and they said, their advice was, can you please get rid of all the climbing? Because it's boot snow, boot snow. No one's interested. <laughs> but if you write 14 or 15 chapters of personal, mm, they'd be interested because they saw something there. In a fit of hubris, I was totally offended because I really thought I was going to win the Booker Prize. I slung it in a drawer <laughs> and um, thought nothing else of it. My wife, God love her, took the book out, took the manuscript out, and gave it to a lady in my local gym whose husband was wealthy and wanted to make movies. He read the script, decided this was his story. That was 07. Right? Throughout 2010 through to 2020, 2018, four or five scripts were written, all focusing on the Everest style of the story. And they all failed. No one could get traction. And I was a bemused bystander, really. I was just thinking, what's going on? I wasn't asked for any money. I didn't care. And then around about 2018, I started to get interested. And I had a crack at writing the script myself. And I wrote it from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. But I wrote it from a bit of a James Bond perspective, because I wanted it to market it, because mm -hmm. I wanted to raise funds. This got the attention of a production company who then unpicked the story. But you really went back to that original recommendation of, of that first book. Yeah, I went back to the personal stuff, yeah. not the climbing. I, I thought that the climbing was a vehicle. It was accidental. Mm -hmm. It was just not interesting. But I went to uh, the personal stuff and I wrote something which was horrific. It got the interest of a production company whose then writer sat down with me for two or three months and extracted, I decided to give it all up. And then when that script landed on my iPad some six months later, mm -hmm. I couldn't read it. It was horrible mm -hmm. uh, because it, it laid it bare. And um, then we it ended up being a film. We had the Royal premiere on the February 28th, 2020, where Her uh, Her Royal Highness arrived, Countess of Wessex. Easily the best and worst day of my life. Never been more scared again. Mm -hmm. Different type of fear. And she sat through, my wife <laughs> sat one side, 
the Countess of Wessex sat the other, and believe it or not, I'm not ashamed to say, they both held my hands. <laughs> sort of weird to think well, about it is, now, I mean, but it was nice. I really have to recommend that that uh, <clears throat> people watch this movie. It's it's. Um, I thought it was really well done. It was not easy to watch, especially knowing you personally. It was uh, it was um, hard to watch at times. Um, but maybe you tell us a bit. I mean, there's several key moments, but maybe just tell us the story behind. Mm. Um, yeah, well, the story is only one story, and I, I do talk about it for my, for my charity now. I'm, I'm pretty blunt. I decided to tell the story to try and do some good with it. Mm. That's the essence of it. Um, so when I was 10, uh, we returned from South Africa with my parents and moved into my grandparents' house in South London. And behind the house was a tea room. And in this tea room, which was owned by a family member, my grandfather's brother, um, I was given a job um, for one pound a week, just sweeping up sure. and cleaning up and stuff, and stocking shelves, most notably, of sweets. One day I dropped a box of chocolate bars on the ground and they broke open. And as I bent down to pick it up, I slipped a bar of chocolate cream, which I'd fallen in love with, in the waistband of my shorts in Africa. There'd, be, there'd been no sweets. Mm -hmm. My mother used to give us raisins. Mm -hmm. uh, the owner had seen me do it, um, told me to put it back, and as I turned around to do it, I was punched from behind in the head. I fell on the floor, and uh, my clothes were ripped off, and he raped me. And I was thrown into a toilet cubicle and told the bandage to clean myself. And um, he kept me all day. But I wasn't allowed home. And then when I was, it was um, my, my father was a strict disciplinarian. He used to cane. And so uh, it was the threat of him being told I was a thief that scared me more. And so I didn't say anything. I didn't really know what happened to me, to be perfectly frank. I was a naive 10-year-old kid from Africa. You didn't share it with anyone? No. I didn't know. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what had happened. I wasn't a 10-year-old kid of today who had access to see stuff online. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing. So then I had to come back to that store uh, in the park every day for, I think, was four months. It was most of the summer. And um, he included his friends at that point, and um, all depicted verbatim in the film. Sometimes I was hooded, and sometimes I wasn't. And one day, I was looking out of, I managed to see out, the st I was looking out the store door, I remember, as he was summoning me, and I saw my father walking towards the store in the distance. And then the door closed and the rest happened. And that day I was hooded. And I remembered thinking later that there was a correlation. I never proved it. However, when we moved away... That so to this day, you don't know if there in that instance your dad was, no. was involved? Okay. No. But soon after moving into our new home and my parents found us one, my father started to visit me in the evenings at that house, having never done that before in South Africa, that I can remember. I don't believe he did. And then one day, um, my mother walked into the bedroom, and I remember seeing her silhouetted, the light was behind her, and she stood there, and it stopped, and he walked out. She walked out. And then myself and my mother ended up living downstairs in the house immediately. And uh, it stopped. She wasn't able to leave because it's not like now where there's an independence and she was given a pile of notes on a Friday, mm -hmm. that sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, however, I grew pretty quickly and uh, my teenage years were a mess. And I was struggling to understand, literally, the realization of what had happened. Mm. And you start to realize, I mean, imagine total naivety and suddenly dawning on you. You get yeah. angry. You get 
it was shocking. You, you, you know, I struggled with what was I? Without sounding un PC, I was horrified. You know, what, what, I, what I'd, have been, I'd become, what I'd, I'd be made, you know? Just, I don't want to sound real cruel, but what was that? What I'd have become? And um, then my mother left the house and she found someone else and left me in that house with him. And that's a big moment in the film. I mean, it's something mm. that actually uh, mm. is quite striking in the film. I thought it was a key moment in the film. I was big enough not to be threatened at that point. Yeah, which you is started depicted. started defending yourself against your dad. That's right, that I was point. physically, yeah. and that's depicted, because they had yeah. that fight, yeah. and I pushed him, and he did go through a door. Mm -hmm. Just as the, you know, Julian Gerald, the director, was allowed me to say where it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was harsh. And I, funny enough, it's when I narrated that to the writer, she focused on the leaving, her leaving, mm -hmm. and I hadn't really thought about it. Really, I know it sounds strange. And then only when we spoke about it did I realize that, yeah, that was a hard thing. Then she left. And did she discuss anything with you? That was not shown no. in the film. She just left with No, she just went. Because in just, the film, you got up in the morning she was and gone. suddenly she was gone. She was leaving. Mm. I didn't run out after her, but she'd gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed downstairs. And, um, and then by pure chance, I got a bit bigger. I lived in that house 18 months with him. And then I was strong enough to find my own way. And then one day, a stupid thing happened. I walked out at the door going to a club and I caught my coat on a rose bush. And I turned around and I kicked the door. And the whole door fell in, like a cartoon scene. At your house? Yes, yeah. my father's house. Yeah. I couldn't believe my eyes. It just fell out. <laughs> and I picked it up and propped it up and went. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, he threw me out, having left the door like that. How old were you there? Just short of 18. Yeah. And um, then I decided, I called my mother to complain that he'd thrown me out. And she backed him. Just on that one single thing, though. I shouldn't have done what I did. Physically, I shouldn't have left the door. That's all she did. But it was enough for me to be so offended in taken as aggregate. Yeah. I took it in the hole. Sure. She was talking about the door. But it was enough for me not to talk to him for 10 straight years and for me to not talk to her for six. During which time, that purgatory I put her, she got very, very ill. Mm. And uh, it doesn't paint me in a nice picture, paint me well, that I then started my trading career at Goldman Sachs. Mm. I was uniquely adapted to that environment because I didn't give a shit about anything. I was very good at... That made you a good trader because you didn't... Yeah. I was never bright, but you combine good instincts with, I'll take you on, mm. and I don't care if I win or lose or die. I was perfect. Didn't know at the time. <laughs> yeah. I could take risks they couldn't take. Mm. I didn't really care. And um, she used to call my office and try and talk to me as she declined. And I took vengeance on her that way, which is dreadful and depicted. Yeah. What the one thing they didn't show in the film is that bit. What they showed was the result, her ending up in a bed. They thought it was too much. Well, they did show you that one time when she came to your office and you kind of shoved her off. That's that what was, I was talking was, about, yeah. yeah. I remember clearly she did come, mm -hmm. and I was like that. And I regret that more than anything. Mm -hmm. I don't regret neglecting my father for 10 years. I don't. And then on impulse, I rang him, and then you see that lunch. Oh, that, that was one of the worst moments in the film, really. Powerful scene. Because you would have thought that, uh, that he would come around and maybe... He said those words. <sighs> it's just me. I better say it. Yeah. Yeah. But he, no, that was... We yeah, did he have said, lunch. you're just like me. It's, uh, about it, so. yeah. Yeah. And I tried to reconcile, and many people have asked, <coughs> why did I try? And this is a lesson for me, really. I think it's because I wanted a father. And that sounds all bit American and schmaltzy. Mm. No, I just didn't have anybody to lean on. Mm. No one, no one. Totally so like, uh, so like, mm. siloed as well. And I thought it'd be nice to be able to ask questions and stuff. Yeah. And um, it didn't work. We just, there wasn't, it was impossible. I tried, but I was quite proud of trying. I also wanted to show off. 
So I've been relatively successful. You, want, you wanted to show him how successful yeah. you were. Yeah. I wanted to rub it in his face. Mm -hmm. You get the, in the film. Mm -hmm. I've got my own plate, got my own parking space, all that. Mm -hmm. I said all that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see the reaction. And all I got was venom. I forget the, uh, was that your first wife or your second wife in the, in the in film, that encounter? It was Vanessa. Vanessa. It was Vanessa. Vanessa. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I, you know, the rest in the film really, um, I went to Goldman Sachs. I was at Goldman Sachs. I was in Madison Square Gardens watching ba basketball in the front court. Great day. And suddenly I heard over the phone with David Tate pick up a courtesy phone. It's like a surreal moment. <laughs> and I went up and my sister said, you've got to come home. Mum's ill. I flew home. They took me home on the rocket. Goldman, very good. And I walked into Mayday Hospital and found her six and a half stone. She was a 12 stone woman the previous time I'd seen her and she tried to kill herself and starve herself to death. That was not shown in the film. No, they showed the result mm -hmm. um, because they didn't want two suicides in one film. Mm -hmm. That was a decision by the director and I conceded. Mm -hmm. So that was a concession I gave and I regret in a way because they needed to see what I'd done. That was my opinion. They said it was to be too much. Mm -hmm. However, she, um, she, she had sodium levels that depleted dehydration and she developed locked in syndrome, but that wasn't before we had a conversation, brief conversation, briefer than is in the film where she apologized to me, but she never knew about the park. She apologized to me for my father because she wasn't able to stop it and for leaving. She didn't know about the store. No, I never told her. I didn't want to make her life worse. And, um, then she died soon after from a heart attack. From just to destroy the body and um yeah was was your suicide attempt was that after or before that moment that was after, was after. that was later yeah. yeah one day i would um soon <coughs> after in 93 um two things that happened my mother had done that to herself and my wife and kids left virtually within days or weeks of each other and it was a bank holiday weekend. I remember it a four day weekend. And at the end of that four day weekend, I was about to give her the kids back. And on the Tuesday morning, I could turn right to go to Goldman or turn left to go somewhere else. And I drove the beachy head. Cliched, I admit, what the hell. Rainy day, there's a coffee shop still there on the beachy head. I pulled up, Goldman lookalike. Went in, ordered a coffee. I was the only person in there. Young girl behind the counter. And on the counter was a small note that said, we're raising money for a local charity, 200 pounds. And they'd raised 50. And I either wrote a check or gave her cash for the balance. Goldman Sachs, large yes. And she was gobsmacked. And I went and sat back down. I drank my coffee, got up, walked out. As I walked towards the edge, where there was a man ahead of me walking a dog, and it's howling rain and everything. Suddenly, these had two... you already gone there with the plan to go to Beachy Head at that point, or or was mm -hmm. that just you after the coffee shop? You just went in that direction. Oh, it was on Beachy Head. Mm -hmm. The coffee shop okay. is on the yeah. cliff. Yeah, yeah. And I walked out, and you're only 60, 70 meters from the edge. And suddenly, these two policemen ran past me towards this guy, <laughs> and I suddenly heard behind me, "No, him." I turned around with the girl pointing at me. The policeman came back and the rest you see in the film. Yeah. And then somewhat embarrassingly, I spent the afternoon in Eastbourne Police Station, which is the <coughs> town next to Beachy Head, with no shoes and no belt, and essentially trying to explain away my actions, or potential actions, mm -hmm. to two bemused doctors who had seen a lot of people doing this, I guess. And in that moment, it dawned on me that I'd made a mistake, that I didn't want to give up my life. Mm -hmm. I was suddenly terrified of losing my role, my job, even though I was alone. I didn't have Vanessa at that point, but alone, I knew I didn't want to just give it up. And I suppose as I listened to a clock chime every 15 minutes for to, nine, to a what? clock chime, mm -hmm outside every 15 minutes that afternoon went on forever at the police station yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you could hear it in the cell <clears throat> and 
I decided that I would not let these four faces of men I have in my head seared into my brain beat me. And I realized they almost had. It almost made me jump as well. Mm. And so I decided that I would claw it back. And so I pleaded with these doctors to let me go, that I was fine. And they did, thankfully. My sister came down. They wouldn't let me drive home. And the next morning, I was at my desk at Goldman Sachs. No one ever did knew. Did your sister, did you explain things to her? Did she know about it? Yeah, I said I'd had yeah. trouble. I didn't ever went into great detail. Yeah. But she knew. And, uh, and then no one knew. I went back to Goldman. I carried on with my life. In 1995, I literally ran into Vanessa, a lady I'd met first time in the mid 80s. And uh, life changed. I told her soon after. And then in 97, I sent the note. And then in 2010, the charity, uh, 2010, 2010, the charity asked me to uh, speak about my experiences. And uh, that's when I gave my first ever speech. I mean, her role in the film is, is quite, yeah. quite important too, because uh, she's very patient with you. And she, um, she, in the end, that's where the real turnaround comes, right? It's not really the moment of the suicide a, a attempt or, or idea. It's, it's really later when, she, mm -hmm. when you open up to her. That's like the key moment of the film, really, isn't it? It is. I mean, fear, fear stopped me going back to BG Head, fear. I knew I didn't want that. Mm. But really, it was finding someone who was tolerant enough to put up with me. And as the film depicts, she had to be tolerant. Mm. You know? And I thank her for the strength to allow the film to be made. Yeah, I wasn't the brave one. You look at it, she was. And... Um, to allow, and when the script was delivered, it became relatively obvious to us all that unintentionally it had become a love story. Mm. And even the writer, I don't think, had intended that in many respects. It suddenly became the ultimate love story. Um, that you would uh, forgive so much to the ascension. You know? And then the famous police scene, mm -hmm. yeah, even though Vanessa is before that, it's slightly out of order, as you mm -hmm. can see. Mm -hmm. uh, love is an act of endless forgiveness, which is exactly what the film's meant to de de depict, alongside demonstrating for those who are not aware that they might have someone in their midst who has gone through something, mm -hmm. your ability to inflict collateral damage, hurt the ones you love, almost to breaking point. For me, I mean, there's really two love stories in there, right? Because uh, to me, what was, I mean, one part that was really touching was uh, you and Vanessa. The other part, it was your relationship with your baby son, you know, which then after that allowed you to become a different kind of father because mm. that to me was, uh, I think that's when, when I started tearing up in the movie. It yeah. was that, really that moment. Yeah. Well, that's been a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But the reaction that's depicted there towards him, mm -hmm. Seth, and has always been a uh, source of regret because it, it it did influence and has influenced our relationship. Over he was time. still very small. Though. He was then, I mean, but I, it continued. Yeah, it did. Yeah. But I've got better and better and better at mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But they're pivotal years, you see, mm -hmm. and you do leave scars, mm -hmm. and I have, mm -hmm. which I regret. But I have to remind myself that I rang my father up because I wanted a father and that I've got to stop doing what I do naturally, which is push the ones I love away for fear of being you, betrayed. You still do that? Yeah. Yeah. Because I fear, in all honesty, I fear the loss that comes with having committed to someone. I don't want that disaster. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to keep everybody at arm's length. Trusting rent. people is difficult. Yeah, opening massively. Up. Yeah. In fact, I was sitting opposite Vanessa not too far long ago, and she said, you still don't trust anybody, do you? And I said, I trust you more than anybody. Mm. That's as good as it's going to get, I think. Not completely, yeah. No. And that's the real problem. 
One one question that always came up in my mind during that, you know, once you you were a grown man, you were successful, and I mean, did you ever think of you know going after those those men and yeah. taking them to court? They died. Oh well, yeah. I know I know the main protagonist died. Mm -hmm. They would be dead by now anyway, but I didn't. And then uh, I found that person died. I found out. Mm -hmm relatively soon after, to be honest, through my mother. I remember the, the announcement at the funeral and that. And it's sort of, uh, I'm very grateful, because if I'd made it to the way I was mm -hmm. when I was 18, 19, mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't have escaped me. Mm -hmm. And that my life would have probably been destroyed. Right. And that would be in the ultimate loss. Huh. And so um, he didn't live too much longer. The um, the scene with your, your with your father and the um, yeah at the end of the movie I, I guess for me when when I watched that I was I was thinking about the fact that you um, put yourself through that whole process again you know I, I'm you know writing a book often they say you know something like that can help you the process of writing a book exactly. telling the story um, but at the same time it must I mean how was that that must have been hugely painful too, that whole process of actually reliving and writing those things down. Is that something that helped you or was it something that maybe even held you back for a while? The process of making the film and, and getting it out there was, became an obsession. And it became an obsession because I thought, in my twisted mind, if I can succeed and if I can turn it into a weapon, for good, mm -hmm. I would have won. Mm -hmm. That was it. And these faces, I could give the middle finger to, finally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because to this point, I'm still, they're still up in this, they're still beating me. And so if I could get that done, turn it on them, and so that millions of people are benefiting from this, mm -hmm. full circle. So I was obsessed with getting this film done once I crossed over, once I realized I had this opportunity. So you imagine my disappointment when the film was released one week before lockdown. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they shut the cinemas after all that work and emotional investment. And that year where I struggled to get it onto platforms, in the background whilst mm -hmm. doing all this mm -hmm. it was one of the hardest times no one knows and then when it reached when it came up towards the one year anniversary and i'd had a core group of investors not really investors friends who donated towards the making of the film but i saw them as investors mm -hmm. and i had to go back to them with the news that it was never going to make their investment back mm -hmm. it was the hardest two months of my life has that changed after after COVID, or is you know can you relaunch or? Yeah. I, I don't There's know. a point where you have to stop because okay. you just keep throwing money at it. Right. Right. You've got to. It takes vast amounts of money to get awareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can make a film for X, but you need four times as much money to make people know it's there. Well, it's anyone difficult. watching this, they sh they should watch the movie. It's an it's a really really good movie and. Um, for me, I mean, the what you're doing is also for the charity. It's it's really, um, in my view, relaying the message that um, yeah, hopefully you're giving others the courage to open up and and go to someone for help, because that seems like where the problems came from with you is is really that you all you held it all inside and you you were all alone with that problem. This ties perfectly to my charity speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say in the speech that I had no one alone, with no charity, no child line, which is an emergency help line, no post-abuse help, just verbatim, just loads of wasted time and pain, unnecessary, yeah. totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Now we have the charity, children are aware at 10, they have a phone line, etc., etc., etc. And the film was hopefully going to be very successful and money would go to the charity, it didn't work. It's got some, but not much. 
but the awareness that it creates of the collateral damage that an individual, you might have someone amongst you. Statistically, in a room of 20, you've got two. Mm. In the average classroom, you've definitely got one. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So you only need to look over your trading floor, you look around in your bar. Everywhere. You go to a yeah. school function and you just look around. And sometimes I can see them. I believe I can see them. And it's meant to give those families the opportunity to help themselves and help that person. And when I give my speeches, I get countless people, and this is the most difficult time for me, people coming up afterwards, mm. whispering in my ear, I couldn't do it, but thank you. That sort of thing. Yeah. And at first I take thousands of emails and I'd try and rewrite to them all and I drowned. Um, but um, my speeches, I do it for the many thousands who suffer with no voice and very carefully hidden pasts. And that's why I've done it. How difficult was it for you to come out like this and talk about it openly? How, I mean, was that something that just happened because of the book? So it just kind of happened on you or was it a, a, was it a conscious decision? Yeah, it was a conscious decision. And I wrote it on the bottom of that email, but it was terrifying. The reason I didn't want to write it, I knew I had an opportunity to make a vast amount of money for the charity. And I knew that if there was a time to do it, it was that time. Mm -hmm. It was, don't raise it as a third party, raise it as an integral part of the charity, mm -hmm. declare. Mm -hmm. The reason I didn't want to do it, really tell Vanessa, not do it to everybody else, but tell Vanessa, was because deep down inside, and this comes out in the film, I hope, it was intentional, you believe, I believe, that if I told her, she'd leave me. But I would be viewed as damaged goods. Mm -hmm. That thing, I can't really put them into words, that I wouldn't be her James Bond or whatever. I wouldn't be it. You started off with her on a very high note, the mm. perfect guy, yeah. successful, charming. And then I got to tell her that. Mm -hmm. And I know to most rational people, they think I lost my mind, but that's what you think. Mm -hmm. You don't believe that you're mm -hmm. worthy of that because mm. you're tainted, scarred, you're, yeah. And of course, the reality is it doesn't work out that way, but. You think that's what's really holding people back is ultimately they, they're actually ashamed for something which they have no, no fault in. No doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Even it's a sexual act. It's not, it's a violent act, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but everyone, sees it as a sexual act, whether you like that or not. Sexual abuse, they still use it in the name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a shame attached to that. Mm -hmm. The irony is, is, even if you analyze it, it's pretty difficult to understand why. There is, it ain't going away, but there is. Because the act is used without shame. Mm -hmm. So why is it shame when it's forced? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't really know, but it is. And, um, It's a conundrum. But if we can reach a stage where it can be discussed, you know, as I say, with no embarrassed reactions, and when it can be regarded ironically as common assault, when we can discuss it that freely mm. without falling over ourselves, without dying on the spot, then the violated people will feel less violated. And that's where I think less ashamed to. and less, uh, it's less much ashamed. easier said than yeah. done. Yeah. But one of me, me, I mean, I took a big chance, right? And uh, there's a millions of people who wouldn't dream of doing it. The charity, it's, I think, has only got like two speakers. Yeah. It seems like it's, it's worked out really well for you. Were there moments, I mean, are there people that actually encounter you in a negative way because of your telling this story? It's no. hard to imagine, but, uh, no. okay. Um, so that's a big message to, to share as well, that nobody took this out against you. No. Some, some people are, are scared of their employers, ironically. In this day and age, I would have thought the opposite. And some people are fearful of family reactions. Mm -hmm. Of course, many of these assaults occur are within, within the, the family. family. Yeah. 
and that's why they keep quiet, the fear of blowing the family to pieces. I've talked to one lady currently. Um, I don't know, I've never met her, but she calls me online, sits and cries for an hour. I try and help her out. And the problem is it's within her family, desperate to get it out, mm. desperate to tell her boyfriend, who's famous, by the way. She won't. And so she lives in this misery. Mm. Mm. And I know she must. And I encourage her to try and do what I've done, write it down, try and use it. David, thanks so much for, for sharing this. Um, it's kind of hard to do the transition now and <laughs> go talk about your role at the World Gold Council. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's kind of going back to that topic of resilience, which uh, you know, allowed you to, um, to build a great career and um, also allowed you to take the lead at the World Gold Council. And um, maybe we can move on to that topic. And it's, it's not a very elegant way of transitioning, but there is no I, don't, I don't know any better, <laughs> any better way. Uh, what's your role? So at, when you started your, your, uh, your job at the World Gold Council as CEO, that was in, was that four years ago, five years yeah, ago? 2019. 2019. Um, how did that come about? And what, uh, what uh, was your motivation to do that? Well, I retired from Christmas.